the heart of India, an extraordinary tiger dynasty is under threat. Machni, the great mother, has ruled this kingdom for over 10 years. Now, her daughter eyes her throne. And so do outsiders. But this prize, so difficult to steal, will prove even harder to keep. Fierce battles, dangerous liaisons, and territorial wars lie ahead. Who will be the next ruler of Rantambor? Early morning in Rantambor National Park, northern India, and a young Bengal tigress is on the prowl. Satra, aged almost two and a half, has begun to hone her killer instincts. Six months ago, she started hunting on her own. The crucial first step to self-sufficiency. Sartre spots a potential victim. But success depends on timing. She lacks experience. It will come. Until then, the deer gets to live another day. But it's not just dinner Sartre's after. She hungers to control a whole kingdom. She already stands out from her two sisters. More detached, more independent, more dangerous. Second sister Atara has a cat's curiosity, but not its courage. And Unis, their mother's favorite, is the most timid of all. Adult tigers are solitary creatures. At just over two years old, they'll soon need to strike out and find territories of their own. Or they can fight for the right to stay here, but that won't be easy. A formidable opponent stands in their way. Their mother, Machli, Queen of Rantambor. Her remarkable ten-year rule has won her fame throughout India. Aged three, she claimed the throne in daring but classic style. By deposing and banishing her own mother, And she's fought ever since, defending the Rantambor Fort territory with all her might, laying her life on the line. <laughs> Tigers usually can defend their throne for only seven to eight years. Matchley's extraordinary ten-year reign attests to her courage and tenacity. And the battle's worth fighting, because the stakes here are so high. Rantambore is one of the best tiger territories in India. Centered round the 1,000-year-old fort, the landscape provides ample food and water almost all year round. The Rajbagh lake below attracts the prey the big cats need. Sambar, spotted deer and wild boar. The National Park, over 400 square kilometers of wilderness, is one of the last great tiger sanctuaries of northern India. It's a haven for other wildlife too.
Within this paradise, Matchley's produced five litters and raised nine cubs to adulthood. But none of them dared stay. Until now. With these new cubs, a new regime. At 13, the Great Queen has reached her twilight years. Five years past her prime, she can't muster the strength she once had. And Sartre knows it. For now, Matchley basks in her fading glory. But maybe she senses the end is near. Young Sartre, the dominant daughter, already samples the perks of this tiger paradise. And she's sharpening her skills all the time. Matchley has taught her the hunting fundamentals. The rest is up to Sartre. takes patience, but eventually she catches a form. Each success increases her independence and feeds her ambition. Of the three sisters, she'll be the first one ready to establish her own territory. And Sartre plans to stay right here, in the only home she's ever known, even if it means war. As the months pass, Sartre grows confident enough to make the first move in her bid for power. But not against her mother. Not yet. She will have to deal with her family one by one. Starting with the weakest. Unis, the most timid, is relaxing in the heat of the day. Sartre has her in her sights. She's an easy target. As cubs, the sisters probably stalked each other in play fights, so Unis has no sense of danger. Lulled into a false sense of security, Unis plays along. Sartre's made her intentions very clear, and she stalks away. The days of innocent sibling rivalry are over. Sartre will continue to bully her like this. Unis 
is now at the mercy of her determined sister. The balance of power within the family has started to shift. With her first victory, Sartre is one step closer to claiming the crown. Unis, defeated and disheartened, slinks off to find the rest of her family. She seeks comfort from her other sister, Atara. Sartre's violent swipe was no empty threat. Unis knows if she stays here, she risks further attacks. Unis has no choice. She'll need to find a new territory. This may be the last time these two sisters are together. Queen Matchley relaxes, unconcerned or unaware of Sartre's plot against her. She's no stranger to conflict and has always crushed her adversaries. She hasn't eaten for days. To find enough food, Matchley must control a territory of 10 to 40 square kilometers and it's vital she discovers a water source. It doesn't help that she's not the only big cat here. Leopards also hunt in these hills. Both big cats depend on wild boar and sandbar. Tigers are stronger than leopards, but Matchley, old and slow, can't compete against them for food. Even worse, her wandering might lead her into the dangerous domain of a male tiger. She may spend weeks finding a safe place to settle. Sartre's reign continues. So far, she's enjoyed a peaceful rule. No more fights. But the park wardens have fixed her with a radio collar. It transmits a signal so they can monitor her movements. The brazen queen ventured beyond the fort boundaries and into poaching territory, and the collar will help to keep her safe, at least from human threats. Not far away, a different kind of danger is approaching. A young male called Atias. He's come courting, lured by the scent of a female in heat. When females are ready to mate, their smell is stronger. Atias can follow scent markings and roars from up to two kilometers away, a path to a potential mate. And today, that's Unis. Within a few hours, he finds her. Both lack experience. And Atias isn't fully adult, so won't be able to father cubs yet. But you can't fault him for trying.
They may mate up to 50 times a day. It's a tiring business. Tigers have several partners over their lifetime. Atias is likely to stay with Unis for a few days. But since this isn't his territory, he'll soon move on. Next to the Rajbagh Lake, Queen Satra patrols her domain, perfuming her path as she goes. Like her sister, she wants to attract a mate. But inviting a suitor into her lush kingdom could bring more than she'd bargained for. And who picks up her signals? None other than Atias. Following the trail, he closes in on her domain. Since winning this territory, Sartre fortunately hasn't had to tangle with any male tigers, which are always heavier and stronger. Luring one onto her turf might be a mistake. Their paths finally cross. Sartre succumbs to Atias's advances. In the throes of tiger passion, she flings caution to the wind. Because Atias isn't sexually mature, his attempts may be more futile than fertile. But for Sartre, this could be a dangerous liaison. Atias might want more than just a mate. He might want Sartre's entire kingdom. Lucky Atias has stumbled into a prize territory without any resident males and with two young single females nearby. It's every male tiger's dream. Why should he think of moving any place else? Satra keeps polishing her hunting skills. young queen of Rantambor still has a lot to learn. Atias is still trespassing on her land. And now he's found her stash of food, he polishes it off. Sartre's hard-won paradise faces a serious threat. And the timing couldn't be worse. The annual monsoon is sweeping up from the south. With the downpour, comes upheaval. Over 80 centimetres of rain can fall in four months, 
flooding Rantambore from June to September. But before the deluge comes the exodus. Both predator and prey leave the fort for higher ground. It's the worst time of the year for hunting and the tigers usually head out too. But Sartre stays put. If she leaves her kingdom now, Atias could make his move and she might never be allowed to return. And so Sartre must ride out the storm for four lean, wet months. Problems rain down on others as well. Away from the lake, Matchley is also struggling. She has little food, little shelter, and hasn't found the territory of her own yet. She'll need to muster all her strength to survive the monsoon. Finally, the rain passes and the floods subside. Animals return to the lake. And Atias, who hasn't shown his face for months, returns bolder than ever. But Sartre can't spend all her time defending her boundaries. She needs to eat. And while she's out hunting away from the lake, there's nothing to stop Atias moving in. He's staking out all the prime places, including Satra's favorite spots. Hunting takes hard work, skill and luck. Even at her best, Sartre bags only one in every 15 targets. The hungry tigress can't afford to make mistakes. She catches a young spotted deer, but still has a problem. Where to hide it from Matthias's greedy eyes? He's starting to know her territory as well as she does. She decides the long reeds by the water's edge are the best place. She decides the long reeds by the water's edge are the best place but it's too late. Atias seems to have heard the commotion of the hunt. Stealthily, he closes in on Sartre. He doesn't want confrontation, just dinner. Sartre senses he's coming. She too wants to avoid a battle. So she retreats, reluctantly abandoning her half-eaten meal. Atias spends over an hour scouting the wetlands. He doesn't find what he's looking for, but he'll keep trying.
Back in the Fort Territory, Queen Sartre finds her regal role unsettling. Taking the land from her weakened mother is one thing, holding on to it quite another. She tries to rest by a banyan grove, but can't. Then she sees what she feared. Atias, the bold and persistent intruder, acting like he owns the place. He's in the heart of her domain. Sartre's had enough. If she doesn't defend her territory now, she will lose it. Mustering the family courage, she decides to take him on. She's never challenged a male before. But she's determined to face her fear. Heavyweight Atias knows she's nearby and prepares himself for battle. Queen Sartre will never share her domain. Atias heads to a clearing, ready for Sartre to bring it on. Today, the Queen faces the ultimate test, a dynasty hangs in the balance. Sartre is going to confront him at any cost. But at the final moment, she backs down. Over 250 kilos of brute force is just too intimidating. She offers a mating position, but Atias doesn't care. He's got what he wants. Atias takes his victory walk. Sartre is left lying in the dust. Her royal dreams are over. Like the mother and sisters Sartre drove out, she too faces exile. Ironically, her weaker siblings have done much better than her. Timid Unis, the late bloomer, established a new domain behind the fort and grows more confident by the day. And Atara thrives in Sariska National Park, where she controls a territory of over 50 square kilometers. But their mother, the once great Queen Matchley, has only her reputation. And she cannot live off that. Finding food remains a challenge. She tries to hunt deer calves, the easiest prey of all. But now she can't even catch them off guard. Matchley is broken, hungry, and tired. Reduced to scavenging, she discovers the remains of an old kill. But it won't sustain her for long.
future looks bleak. Now, for the first time in over a decade, Rantambor has a king. Atias won the best territory in India. He'll enjoy the riches of tiger paradise, at least until another challenger comes along. But for now, his future looks secure. Sartre is the loser. She didn't have the strength to take on a male. After only nine months, she's been knocked from her throne. Her courage and ambition had taken her far. But she couldn't hold on to the land she had won. Now the deposed queen must make a fresh start in a strange land. Finding some small portion of this big wilderness to claim as her own. But she's still young, and her prime years lie ahead. This one-time tiger queen might even reclaim her kingdom and restore her dynasty. Sartre lives to fight another day.